Welcome to the Hunter's Advantage Podcast, where a group of budget-minded hunters scour the woods for whitetail bucks and whatever other big game is in season. Tune in each week to hear the hilarious public and private land hunting stories and mistake-filled lessons learned. We believe that every hunt brings us closer to God and that we exist to share the good news. And now, your hosts, Christian Babcock and Jake Gaylord. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Hunter's Advantage podcast. Today, we are joined by a special guest, John Eberhardt. This is this is round two for having you on the podcast, so we're really thankful that you are willing to come back on. Sure. Anytime. So I've, I've been listening to, uh, you get, you've been on several podcasts recently and, um, I want to, I want to start here. Uh, it's, it's interesting. We were talking about before the podcast, how you've been in the, the sporting goods industry for, I think you said over 30 years. How is retirement? How are you enjoying it? I am loving retirement. It is definitely not overrated. I'll be <laughs> super glad when this book, I'm writing another book in uh, conjunction with a little bit of saddle hunting information. Um, and Greg Godfrey is kind of the co-author. He's he's given some of the saddle information into the saddle chapter. Other than that, I've pretty much written the rest of the book. Um, but other than that, yeah, everything is phenomenal. I'll have lots of free time once that's done. I've been working on that for 13 months and pretty much every day from 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning till 7 or 8 o'clock at night when I'm home. I didn't even, I've got a I live on a lake and I've got a pontoon and a fishing boat on docks. And uh, <laughs> I fished one time last year because I was working on that book. So. I couldn't, I couldn't imagine writing a book like the amount of words or, or the stuff that you have to put into it, the editing. That's, I know it's a, it's a labor of love, but and you've written, you've written several already. So you probably got the, you know how to write, you know, work the pen by now. This is my fourth book and I almost failed English in high school. English was <laughs> far and away my worst subject. I was terrible at it. I couldn't put a sentence together on a bet. Um, but I just started writing and learned how to write. And yeah, this will be my fourth book. And it's going to be over, I don't know if you guys are into Word, but it's well over 200,000 words, mm -hmm. which is, you know, it's going to be about 30 chapters. It's going to cover everything anybody wants to know about deer hunting. And it's going to be targeted for... Whitetail hunting, obviously, with any weapon, uh, but, you know, it's going to focus on bow hunting. Um, and it's also going to focus, I, I've got to be perfectly honest, it's going to focus on uh, bow hunting in pressured areas, hunting naturally in heavily hunted areas. Because uh, if you can do that and be successful, you can kill deer any place. Do you have like a I'm crossbow gonna, chapter or anything like that? Uh, no, there will not be. <laughs> but it's, it's hunting information that you can right. use weapon with. Yeah. No, I know. I had to. I had to throw that one in there. <laughs> that hey, uh, it's okay. You don't <laughs> crossbows, but hey, they're not going anywhere. So you got to make them inclusive. Yeah, yeah. I think in Michigan now, most of the stores, uh, probably eighty to ninety-five percent of the bows that are walking out the front doors are crossbows. I think mm -hmm. it's pushing about 60% of bow hunters in Michigan now have are using a crossbow. Ohio, it's over 70% because they've had crossbow, legal crossbow hunting for quite a few more years than most of the other states. Why do you think that is? Is it just the lack of, I mean, it can't be a lack of know-how with a vertical bow because, I mean, there's YouTube, there's there's plenty of information to to get set up right for a, for a traditional comp compound bow. So why do you think that is? Do you want my honest answer? All right. That's why we have you on. <laughs> <laughs> most hunters are lazy. Um, most hunters are lazy. They don't want to uh, have to practice any more than they absolutely have to with a crossbow. You can shoot probably twice the distance as you can with a compound bow. I, on an average hunter, there are guys that shoot leagues and stuff that are capable of shooting 50 yards with a bow. But with a crossbow, 50 yards, with today's crossbows, 50 yards is not squat if you got something to rest, rest it on. Um, so it's easier. You never have to practice. You could pick up more distance. Uh, you don't have to have an archery tech to use one. It's a one size fits all. You could give me a crossbow sighted in. I could take it out and kill deer with it. You know, it doesn't have to be fit for your draw length. It doesn't have to be fit for the proper sight. It doesn't have to have the right length arrows. Uh, it doesn't have to be the right poundage. There's just so many things that when you use a compound bow, you have to have an archery tech for. And with a 
with a crossbow, it's a one size fits all. It's just like the baseball caps you got on your head. You can take it off and give it to anybody else and use it. It just yeah. comes down to lazy. People, hunters are lazy for the most part. Well, they're people, right? Just like anything else, like in every every profession, every race, every color, ever there's people. Yeah. Laziness does not discriminate. Laziness does not discriminate, and uh, they're obviously not passionate about it. If you're passionate about bow hunting, uh, you know, bow hunting was created because it's different than gun hunting, and it requires skills to get close to deer. And with a crossbow, you're someplace in between a rifle and a and a bow. So, uh, it it you know, bow hunting was not designed for crossbows, or it would have been a bow crossbow season. You know, I I wish that they would um actually do crossbow licenses most of the states that fell the full inclusion crossbow was about 12 years ago after michigan fell everybody else toppled like dominoes um i wish they'd have separate licenses because now it really bugs me i can't keep stats anymore you know all of my other books i could keep stats i could go to all the uh pny statistical data books every two years they publish a new book and i would totally research all the scores of every freaking deer from every state, uh, you know, what it scored, what time of season it was shot. I researched all that stuff for all my other books. And now I can't do like P and Y entry ratios per licensed hunters because crossbow hunters and bow hunters buy the same tags. So those stats cannot be researched anymore because you can't oh, differentiate a crossbow tag from a bow hunting, a regular bow hunting tag. If you yeah. Thing. yeah, that's, that's interesting. I've heard all the arguments too. It's a, well, I have, I have a full-time job and I don't have any, I don't have time to practice or yeah, that's I don't, nice, that's a nice excuse. Yeah. I know. It's like, it's like anything too. I mean, and I'm going to give you up for this on here, which I'm fine with that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't realize how bad it was uh, until I went to, I have a local shop here in Georgetown and I went in and in Texas, a lot of the times when you draw the, one of the, um, the public land tags for a whitetail hunt, they have like a proficiency test. So you have to like go into an archery shop and shoot and like the technician will like say if you're proficient or not, you can take that and you know, you can get your draw hunt tag. Right. There was a guy that came in with a Raven and he took it out of the, he took it, unzipped it out of the, the bag. And he's like, I haven't shot this thing in like nine months. And he pulled it out and he said, well, what kind of group can you hold at 20? And he said, Oh, if I'm not shooting a dime, I'm pissed. Like he said, he said, I can't aim at the same spot twice. And I watched the guy pull it out and it was, and I was like, Oh my God, I'd never seen one shot before. I've heard people complaining about him, but I was like, dude, I, that didn't even give the deer a chance. If they're an archery range, like, Holy moly. They're like a rifle. It's like shooting a 22 rifle, except it's a lot more deadly. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's nuts. But so I'm, I'm interested in hearing how was your, how was your past season? I mean, you're obviously always travel hunting, hunting public, hunting permission properties. How did your last season shake out? Uh, last season sucked. I killed one book buck in Michigan, my 35th book buck in Michigan. Um, and I hunted in Indiana with a big group of guys, 16 guys, uh, tethered kind of put that together. Um, that was interesting. It was on who's your national forest down, uh, in Southern Indiana. And I was blown away at how many deer there were. I passed on a couple like 110 inch bucks, which other guys were shooting those. Um, 16 guys, there were seven bucks killed. Two of them were in the mid to upper 130s and all the rest were in the 100 to 115 inch class. Um, but there was a lot of deer down there and they moved a lot. You know, even the bigger bucks were moving a lot during daylight. And uh, I, I was pretty impressed. That's a huge, huge area of public land, Southern Indiana, Hoosier National Park. It's got it's got little places all all over the southern part of Indiana that, that are called Hoosier National Park wreck areas. Have you ever been there before? No, nobody had ever been. Nobody had ever stepped foot on this ground. We had hunters. Uh, they actually did an interview for this, and they're they're going to post these hunts. Sometime this summer, they're editing them right now. It's going to be a series of, uh, of hunts. I don't know what platform it's going to be on. Um, but there were guys from Iowa, uh, Minnesota, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Michigan, PA. Um, nobody was from Indiana, uh, Illinois. Basically, nobody was. There wasn't any two people from the same state. 
They had to interview for these openings. They had to be sat launchers, obviously, because it was put on by tethered. And uh, everybody stayed in the same building with the Airbnb, just basically a big building full of beds <laughs> that people stay into recreation at the park. Because there was a big lake there, too. I took my boat, so I'd have access to places where it would be like a two or three mile walk if you walked in from a road. Um, so I took a 14 foot boat with a 25 horse motor. And that worked out pretty good for me, but it kind of tied me down because other guys were having me take them places. So it kind of mm. left mm. me tied to the boat, whereas I really wanted to go to some other public lands, you know, that weren't attached to the to the lake area. Should have dropped them off at the boat ramp. Be like, here you go, boys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. awesome with my boat. This was a monster lake, and it was. I, I remember one morning I got up and I went down there and I, this was the first morning I went out by myself after I had scouted a place out and it was like at least two to three miles up the lake and it was windy. It was dark. It was pitch black and I got out there maybe a quarter mile and then I kind of went past this wooded area that was blocking the wind. I could tell it was windy, but as soon as I got into this big open area, oh my God, the there was white cats and I'm in a 14 foot freaking boat. <laughs> I was concerned that I might capsize, but I kept going, you know, straight into the, into the waves. And I, I finally made it. And then all the time sitting in the tree, I was worried because usually if it's windy before daylight, it's going to be windier at nine or 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock mm -hmm. in the middle of the day. Uh, fortunately, the wind actually died because all the time I was sitting in the tree, I was thinking about my return trip back to the boat dock. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I uh, it. it was interesting. It was an interesting hunt, and I was very impressed with a lot of the guys. I mean, they all—all all of the guys have some sort of a platform that they could show the videos on. So they all had some sort of a social media platform, and they all filmed their own hunts. So everybody was filming their hunts, other than me. I don't—I mm. don't film sh kills. I—I I think sh filming an actual kill, I'll film deer coming into my tree, uh, but I won't film. Film a kill because I think it just lends uh, fodder to PETA and anti hunters as far as litigation and lawsuits. I think a hunter having to see an arrow go into a deer is pretty crude. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. But I mean, for people like us, it doesn't matter because even if we try to get the kill on on camera, it, you know, most of the time you got to pick which way to kill it with the camera or with the bow. And most of the time, <laughs> we're yeah. not good enough to do both. But, uh, no, uh, going back to that that boating uh, portion, yeah. I tried to boat one time uh, in in like a little low heck I don't know eight ten foot kayak across. It wasn't even across this lake. It was like one in one a, a little cove or something. And on on X, it didn't look like that. It was that far. So I that and uh, so what I did is I obviously tied my bow like on the front of this little kayak and. I was just sitting there paddling and I was making pretty good time until uh, my headlamp wasn't the best. And so moving along pretty, pretty, I mean, was it not the best or were your batteries dying? Uh, my batteries was dying actually is, it didn't is have an extra set of batteries. Yeah. Was the problem. But I found out that there was submerged like logs somewhere yeah. underneath the water. And there was a lot of uh, dead standing timber right there too. But, after going there, I was in about capsizing about, I don't know, 50 times. I was like, okay, I might just have to drag this kayak all the way around this cove just to get back to my truck. Cause it, it scared me enough where I was like, I don't know if I should be able to do this. Cause after that you had to go like half a mile an hour just so you, when you hit those submerged logs, it was like, I don't know. It was sketchy. So well, that yeah, was my experience. Was dippy, so yeah, hitting a submerged log with a kayak would definitely not be cool. They're kind of tippy in the first place. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, those I've seen those tether guys. They did a they did a series. I think it was maybe last year where they had a bunch of young guys hunt out of a bus. Is didn't yeah, they? They do, and yeah, actually, it's. Uh, do I have that hat? I actually have a hat because I actually went down there. They came to Michigan. They were going to different states. And when they all were in Michigan, there's six of them. They were all young guys under under 30. I went down there because Tethered asked me to go meet these guys. And I had them all sign a hat. 
So it was pretty cool because they all were like, wow, you want me to sign? You want me to sign a hat for you? And I was like, hell yeah, man, this is pretty cool. I, I can't remember what it's called. They did that for two years. Um, and, and it's all on public land. Uh, the first year they did it, somebody shot a, a 140-some inch buck, I think, somewhere in there in Nebraska or one of those, you know, Midwestern big buck states. Mm-hmm. Uh, but other than that, you know, they, they are, they're, the, they're just shooting deer. You know, they're not really there for monster bucks. Um, they're just shooting deer because Tether just wants them to get film, you know, footage of deer hunting, just regular young guys just coming up and, you know, giving them that opportunity. And they all live in a bus. They took a school bus and totally redesigned it. And it's, it's actually pretty cool. That's yeah. that would have been the dream pre-marriage for me having having oh. six buddies in the in a butt. I mean, maybe not for the smelling aspect, you definitely <laughs> need some scent control. But I feel like going out for a full fall, like there'd be that'd be so fun. I just wonder because there was like six guys, and there were they were gone for like eight weeks, like two months. Tethered paid for everything, and it's you know for a young guy like your guys's age that date a lot and stuff. I was wondering if they went to bars or anything mm. on Friday nights. And stuff. Pull that bus up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's probably a few evenings uh, only hunted yeah. on a few yeah. of those days for sure. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, that, that was, that was pretty cool that they did that. I don't know if they're continuing that. It had a name. I just can't think of it off the top of my head. Yeah. I, yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't either. It was, it's interesting though, because you, you talk about like, you see people that shoot a big buck year after year after year, maybe have they have the right permission or the right property or they figured out a single piece of public land, right? But in these yeah. in the series that you're talking about in the series with the bus, it's cool because you really get to know who knows how to read sign and who knows how to how to set up on a buck depending on, you know, uh, regardless of the terrain. I feel like you would learn so much as a hunter just being able to travel around and just see different flavors of stuff of how the whitetail move and hunt them in those areas. I feel like it really refine you as a, as a hunter. You are 100% correct because this is hill country, Southern Tennessee or Southern Indiana, all across Southern Illinois, Southern Ohio. Uh, that's all hill country. I mean, pretty steep hills, not mountainous, but very steep hills. And, um, there was one hunter, he works for tethered Jared Schaefer. I don't know if mm-hmm. you've heard him. Yeah. Um, call him the redheaded ninja or something like that (laughs) (laughs) but anyway being from west virginia he he cut his teeth on hunting hill country and to me you know all these guys are young i'm freaking old and i'm i'm listening to these guys they're all excited coming in showing each other their footage and stuff and i'm listening to them they're getting busted from the wind which obviously i never replied to that until the last night but uh jared definitely I could just tell by the way he talked and he was paying attention to thermal drafts and ravines and swirling winds, which in hill country is always a monster deal. We've got a huge part of the book on hill country. You know, hunting hill country requires a totally different skill set than hunting, you know, low level ag slash timber swamp. You know, hill country is just different because ridges and valleys and saddles and thermal drafts and swirling winds, you know, you just, if you're not, if you have to hunt the wind, it's very difficult. And you have to know how how the mature bucks that you're after, how they work the wind during their movements during daylight hours. You know, they'll they'll go down and move through thermal hubs like in the evenings. You know, all the thermal drafts are going downward. Um, so anytime you've got a ravine, you know, they can go down in the bottom of the ravine, which all the drafts are coming down there. And all the swirling winds are going to come down through there in different directions as well. So any deer that came up the ridge up above that ravine, you know, their scent is going to end up down in that thermal draft area. So bucks and in the morning, it's just the opposite because thermal drafts are going upward. So um, it was really interesting how well Jared knew how to work that. I was very impressed because most of the guys did not because most of them came from flat, flat land hunting. Yeah, we've we've got absolutely reamed on social media. I mean, who cares? But it's interesting to see which what things fire people up and don't. We uh, we kind of think that well, we hunt the Kayamichi Mountain Range in Arkansas and Oklahoma, and oh. 
we see a lot of the dudes that hunt the big woods um, or, you know, stuff maybe in Tennessee or just mountain hunters in general. It seems like there's a lot more consideration that they have to take with thermals and winds and, you know, maybe lower deer densities and stuff. And you just see a lot of those folks go from mountain hunting to doing really, really well in ag places and different places all across the country. We kind of think that people that hunt mountains, at least from our perspective and our limited perspective, it seems like they just kind of get it a little more. Like they're just a little bit more refined. Do you think that's true? I totally agree with that. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. When I first started hunting uh, Southern Ohio quite a few years ago, when I started hunting out of state in the nineties, yeah, it was different. Yeah. It was different. I mean, I wasn't concerned about me getting winded because I was using sunlock at that point in time. Mm -hmm. Um, But the deer moved differently. The deer definitely, the mature bucks definitely moved according to thermals and swirling winds and the undulations of the land. Basically, they moved according to the the terrain features. They like to feed on on flats. You know, on the side of the ridge, it might be a flat area with some oaks on it. They like to feed on flat ground. They would transition down ridges, down sides of ridges, there'd be runways down sides of ridges. But anytime they were actually going to feed, they preferred to feed on some sort of flat terrain. So they'd be up on the top of the hills or on the flats or down in the bottoms. And, uh, and it, but it was just different to watch how the mature bucks would. And I didn't see a lot of mature bucks. I was on public land, obviously, but it was just interesting to see how the deer moved according to the winds and the thermals and the, the swirling winds. Cause when you're on hill country, if you're on the side of a ridge, you know, you could throw milkweed every three seconds and <laughs> go in a different, dip- I mean, I'm not a milkweed yeah. guy whatsoever. I did in the seventies and eighties and early nineties, but not since Setlock, but the milkweed's going to go different directions each time. And it'll, you'll, you'll see it drift down and all of a sudden it'll turn and go right. And then you'll watch it to 10 yards and then it'll turn and go left. You know, the wind's just moving around all the time. And, and the hillier the country, the more the wind swirls. Well, it, it seems hard, too, because those deer in those terrains, they seem, <laughs> to, at least from my perspective, really nomadic. Like, you see them bed in one area, and then the next day they might come from a completely different direction. It's not like in, in big ag, hey, that, that big block of timber, that's bedding, this is food. They come out of that every night, and you see them doing the same yeah. thing. It's like you even when you think you're doing the right thing, it's like every, as soon as you think you're in the game, they're like, oh, I got a curveball for you. I was actually betting here today. And so yeah. now I'm going to get you. Well, they bet according to the wind. You know, that's something that hill country doesn't have. It doesn't have swamps. It doesn't have defined bedding areas like ag areas and swamp areas and big timber areas do. Like you were just talking about, you got deer come from A to B, you know, pretty much regularly, unless it's during a rut and they're pursuing those in uncharted courses. But in hill country, uh, you know, if, depending on the way the wind's blowing, they may bed up on the crest of the hill. If the wind's blowing out of the west and there's a hill, they will bed on the east east side of the crest of the hill. That way they got a visual down the hill once the foliage is down during the rut phases. So they can see stuff down the hill and anything coming over from the other side of the hill, the wind's going to blow over the crest and they're going to the smell danger or a doe from the other side. So if the wind changes the next day, they're not going to bet in that spot because it's not advantageous for them mm-hmm. to do so. So they change their bedding areas according to the wind and the thermals and the swirls. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's interesting. It kind of blew my mind when we, we went up to Kansas and hunted in 2022. Uh, we had this big isolated bedding area kind of in, a, in an oxbow in a lake. Uh And it was probably 10 acres of timber. I'm like, there's no way a big buck would put himself like back isolated against that water in that timber. And Jake sat up there and it was like, I think an hour and a half later, here comes a 140 inch buck out of that timber to go to the bean field. I was like, oh my God, like (laughs) there's no way they actually do that. Cause from an aerial perspective, you're just like, he's trapping himself in there. He probably doesn't know that in his mind, but it just blew my mind. Cause then coming from the mountain stuff or plains to that, it's like, I can't believe it can actually be that simple in some, sen- sen- you know, scenarios. So, so he had to cross the river from the oxbow to get to the crops? No, it was, no. it was like an oxbow and then crops up next to it. He came oh, out okay. of it. Yeah. Okay. It was like he had surrounded himself three sides by water. And then there was like only one way out and he did that. It was crazy. Basically. And then there's like another strip of big timber or I say big timber there, just another strip of timber uh, uh, along the other edge of it. And there's this one little sliver uh, 
alongside the creek and it's just like okay if he's going to move from one piece of timber to the other he's going to be moving right here and sure enough within like 15 yards that's exactly where he moved and it's just like you go to that hill country and there's really none of that or at least i never see any really good defined trails or heck most of the time even even droppings but i don't know just like christian said it can be that simple Listen, guys, we wouldn't be able to do the podcast if it wasn't for you all. So we just want to say that you guys are greatly appreciated. And thank you for following along each week. And speaking of support, we are partnered with Out on a Limb Manufacturing. And I can tell you from firsthand experience, Matt and Chase are great down-to-earth guys. And they make some of the best saddle hunting products out there. Whether you're looking for a set of climbing sticks or a mobile, lightweight, hang-on tree stand, or maybe you're even a one-sticker, you mean tree pilates yes tree pilates if you've been to the grocery store or the gas station lately you know that uncle joe is doing his absolute worst to take all your money that's why we need hunting gear that lasts year after year and trust me i've been rocking the same out on a limb shikar climbing sticks for four years and the ridge runner 2.0 saddle hunting platform for a few years as well this gear is built to last we can confidently say that out on a limb is the best bang for your buck and it's the best gear if you want to deflate a big old buck Ooh. Make sure you use code HNTA15 at outonalimmfg.com for 15% off anything on their website. So if you can show them the same support that you guys show us, please go to outonalimmfg.com and use code HNTA15 for 15% off at checkout. Now let's get back to the podcast. Yeah, typically, you know, you're right. They Typically, that's not the case. They don't like betting on the inside of an oxbow. They'd rather bet on the outside outside of one um, because, yeah, they feel blocked in. Yeah. You know, I, I remember I was hunting this guy's property or, I, no, this guy had me down to look at his property, and he was a land management a little bit. He had a food plot, and he planted all this big, tall, this got eight foot tall grasses around it and i'm not a i'm not a land management guy so i don't know anything about what kind neither of do we but it was uh it was totally blocked in the small food plot by these big tall weeds where there was no visual okay now bucks will bed in marsh grasses and in cattails under deadfalls whatever you know where they may only have a visual of two or three feet because it's just a wall around them, but they're bedded. They're not up and they're not moving. When they're up and moving, they like to have some semblance of what's going on. And to, for a, I told the guy for a monster buck, which he had those in his area, to come into this food plot, you know, he had a little opening where his tree was, where the deer was supposed to come into this, because it was totally blocked in otherwise when he saw weeds, which they would walk through the weeds, but most of them came through this opening. I said, they just don't, the big bucks don't like being in here in the daytime. They don't have a visual. They can't see danger. And actually those weeds, if, even with the winds, those weeds are going to deflect the wind because it was a wall of weeds. So if there's wind coming in from outside this food plot and it's hitting these weeds, it's going to deflect the wind and not come into the food plot. So not only can he not visually see, he can't smell anything. So he cut those weeds down. So the deer would have a visual. I mean, he obviously had some more than bucks and does coming into it. They didn't care, but a mature buck, that's a totally different type of deer. And, uh, and then he started doing better. I actually picked out two trees. He said, when you leave, cause he was, he lived in Arizona. He works for the government. He was, he works along the border, border patrol. And, um, he said, when you leave, put, put a couple tacks in the two trees on this property that you would hunt. And, uh, I felt really good about it because I put two tacks in two different trees. One was on a bench on the side of this hill, like I was talking about a few minutes ago, and it had a couple oaks on it. And then the other one was a tree that I knew once he cut these weeds all down, the deer, there was a ravine that fed up into this food plot, and there was a huge bedding area at the base of this ravine on a different bordering property. And I knew because I could tell by the runways and stuff, the deer were coming up that ravine in the evening because the thermals would be going down that ravine so they could smell any danger as they're coming up it. So I picked a tree on that ravine for an evening hunting and, and uh, his next five bucks killed on that property were out of those two trees. 
which oh, that's really awesome. helped me. Yeah, I was pretty happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> and the one in the ravine was the one that he shot. He shot three out of the one in the ravine and two out of the one on the, on the oak flat on the side of the hill. Oh, that heck yeah. Cool. Yeah, that's that's interesting on the because we we've seen it happen where uh i had a buddy that bought a property and it was basically just like a 10 acre wheat field and he had a consultant i believe tell him that uh the reason bucks weren't using that wheat field as much is because there wasn't any screening cover around it like they could basically stand in the timber and just see check if there's does on the field visually but i don't know i don't know if they're if their eyesight works like that, I don't know if they can actually look out on a 10 acre field and see absolutely everything or not. I'm like, like you, I'm not a land manager, so I have no idea, but I thought that was interesting. Uh, what kind of field was it? It was a wheat field, like a winter wheat field. Okay, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they can, they can see a long distance across an open field, obviously. That's, so that's not, you're talking about looking into the timber beyond the wheat field? Or? No, like they were standing in the timber. It was kind of a weird configuration. It, it wasn't just like a big block. It was like a T. Like it had like different little contours in it. Oh, okay. And yeah, yeah. so Corners. he was, yeah, he was telling him like to put screening cover around all of it. That way, if a buck wants to check that field, he has to come through that screen to get the visibility to check it. And I, I don't know. I'm not a land manager, so. I don't manipulate any land like between Jake and I, there's not a single property we could go and like plant something, yeah, you know? Yeah, so yeah. I don't know, but I thought that was interesting. Yeah. 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 That, that is, that is interesting. But if it's a big enough field, I mean, this was a small food plot. I'm talking yeah. about. So he was like locked in. I can remember I was hunting in Iowa. By the way, I did kill a buck in Michigan last year. It was a hundred and a little over mid one twenties, 11 point. Heck yeah. I, I, I'll, I'll mention that in a second, but, I remember in Iowa, I was hunting and it was on a point. So you had a point like this. This was all timber down in here. Big, huge ledge going down into Cattail Swamp. But this was all big field. I mean, probably a half a mile long by a half a mile long this way. And I sat in a corner tree on the tip of that point. And I had a, a decoy. My I had Doreen. I call my decoy Doreen. Doreen. <laughs> yeah. And I had her at 45 degrees out. So a deer coming from me in the, this field down here or the field over here could see it, could see this decoy. And uh, it was really windy and I'm sitting in this corner tree. Uh, it's an evening sit. And I looked around, I looked both directions. I saw a couple of those over here, no big deal. And I, I was getting cold. So I opened up my thing and I grabbed a couple adhesive body warmers, air activated body warmers, and I stuck them on my base garment and then as i was pulling everything back up because i was paying no attention to my decoy which is 20 yards in front of me as i'm zipping starting to zip my thing up i looked i just out of the corner of my eye i caught moment there was like 150 inch buck standing oh there my with my doe decoy and he picked up me zipping my coat back up i'm mm. looking at me staring right at me he's right there right next right behind the decoy sniffing the decoy's tail <laughs> and obviously as soon as i made another movement he was even at eye. <laughs> uh, that was kind of interesting but the one i shot in michigan last year which is totally opposite of open areas like i just talked about um i was hunting in a marsh in a pretty dense marsh where deer bedded a lot. And there was a little buffer brush along the edge of it, which is relatively common. And then on the other side of this brush was open timber. So I was expecting, because this was pre-rise, I was expecting if I did see a mature buck for it to be skirting the edge of this marsh, sent checking for does that came out of the timber into the marsh you know after daylight and uh all at a, what was it about 8 45 well pretty late in the morning i heard two deep guttural grunts out of this open timber and i'm talking this timber the other side of this edge of the marsh where i'm at it's wide open there's there's grass in it leaves and nuts there was like beech nuts oaks chestnut trees you name any kind of a nut tree that's in michigan and it was in this open timber but there was a canopy over the top and there was literally nothing on the ground other than nuts and leaves and there was one autumn olive bush i'll tell you about that in a minute. 
But anyway, so I hear these two deep guttural grunts and um, I can't see because there's still some foliage on the trees. I can't see into the open timber. And about 10 minutes later, I heard that same guttural grunt south of me going into the swamp, going into bed. And I'm like, I can't believe it sounded like I'm mature buck by how deep it was. But as you well know, you know, the, the, t the tone really doesn't tell you anything. So when I got down and I walked out, because I had to exit through that open timber. I, I entered in the morning in the dark through the swamp, but I exit through the open timber after I'm done. So I'm not spooking anything with my exit. So I'm walking through this open timber and I'm like, you know, I heard that grunting. I'm going to look around a little bit and see what he did. Because it had rained all night and, and it quit raining just about daylight. And uh, I found two fresh scrapes. And obviously they were scrapes he worked because I heard him grunting and these were fresh scrapes that had big tracks in them. So I went to my car, got some, uh, got some tethered one sticks, set up a ring of steps in this maple tree about 18 yards. And there was, there was one autumn olive bush in this whole wooded area. And that's where the scrapes were. They were underneath the, uh, this autumn olive bush. And I set up that tree. I hunted that night from that tree. And uh, I had a doe and two fawns come through and that was it. And then the next morning I got back in the tree and uh, I heard something coming from the Northeast. There's a pit cornfield probably a quarter mile away to the Northeast or Northwest. And uh, and it was, a doe, it was that same doe and two fawns. And they came through right at the crack of daylight. And they were eating nuts under me and they were eating leaves off the branches I'd snipped off this maple tree, the fresh leaves on the ground. And then they, they moved on. And about, I don't know, probably a half hour after broad daylight, uh, I hear another deer coming. I turn around and it's that, you know, 11 point, which for Michigan, that's a big buck. It was a four and a half year old buck. Mm -hmm. And um, even though it was only 120s, 120 inches. Um, and here this buck comes and he comes in and he, he's, he stops north of me. There was a deadfall and he starts sparring his antlers in the branches of this deadfall. And he's literally 10 yards away. But I'm I'm in a position where I'm facing the scrapes that are south of me. So I'm not gonna make I'm not gonna make a move now because I know he the direction he's coming, he's gonna go to those scrapes. Hmm. He's dicking with his tree for probably 10 minutes, which is a long time. And then he walked right under the base of my tree, walked right over to those scrapes and and I shot him. And that's the first time I've hunted open timber like that in Michigan since the seventies. I mm. never, ever hunt open timber in Michigan. They mature bucks just don't move through open timber in daylight hours. And this one was an exception. So what never, do you think never. that was, <laughs> do you think that was because of just the, uh, just that bush there, it kind of being, you know, just a smaller limited resource in that area. Do you think that's what drew him to that, that particular spot or, why do you think that buck was there? Uh, well, there was bedding and there was security cover around this open timber. I'd say this open timber was probably size wise, I'd say six or seven acres. Okay. But around the perimeter of that was all security cover. So typically, if you're in a pressured area, they're going to go through the edges of the security cover, they're going to skirt the right. edges of the report be in the security cover. That's why I was sitting in the edge of that swamp in the brush along the perimeter. Um, why he went through there, I have no idea because it wasn't full blown rut. The does weren't in estrus. That doe, you know, she had her fawns with her. She did, was definitely not in heat. And plus he's, he's a half an hour behind her. Um, mm -hmm. I have no idea. You know, the deer are just like people. Everyone's got a different personality and that deer the way he was moving, he was lucky to be four and a half years old. He should not have made it. <laughs> what what month and what day did you shoot that buck? That was October 18th. It was okay. just on the very cusp of pre run Okay. So they are they were freshening up scrapes. And so you found that one scrape and you got on it. Yeah, there was two. He, he made two scrapes that, that morning prior. They were right next to each other under this autumn island. You like to do that in October quite a bit, like hunt, hunt fresh scrapes? Oh, well over half the bucks I've killed have been on over scrape area. At, at I shouldn't say on a scrape area, but there was scrapes nearby. You know, I may have been in an apple tree or a white oak tree or a red oak tree. Uh, 
that was dropping acorns or dropping apples, but it didn't have low enough branches to put a scrape under. So, you know, 15 or 20 yards away, there was a scrape because those were feeding at these food lo natural food locations. So obviously that's where the bucks put their scrapes is where there's doe activity. So uh, well, well in excess of 50% of bucks I've killed in my lifetime have been scrape related. Okay, so I want to scrape guy, huge scrape guy. Well, that's th that's good to hear because uh, you sound like the right person for this question. So we uh, were on our public piece in the Kaimichis, and we were <coughs> after this one certain buck. And granted, it was like it was like two miles in, but it uh, our access was like this somewhat old abandoned logging road, but it was kind of overgrown a little bit. And in some some portions of it, it was still uh, relatively short. I don't know why, but I'm when you get back there, your tech, Texas Kaimichi, is that Texas? that's in Oklahoma and Arkansas. Yeah, is yeah, that okay. not range? Oh, this was okay. in Oklahoma. All right. Yeah. So uh, when you're walking down this this old abandoned logging road, uh, once you got probably a mile and a half back there, it was like scrape on this side of the, uh, of the of the road, scrape on this side of the road, and all on the downhill slope of this little logging road it was just nothing but a sea of oaks and normally down there you can kind of like find a limited resource you know whether that be bedding or oaks or whatever and try to take advantage of that but again it was just a sea of oaks so you really couldn't like it was almost overwhelming you know where to kind of set up for that aspect of it how but far, how far down the hill from the, where the the lane was the old trail where the scrapes were oh what do you think christian that strip that strip of oaks is probably Two, three hundred yards thick, and it goes along a creek, just like the whole way. Yeah. But how far it was. was it from the old? Uh, uh not very. Maybe, maybe eighty hundred yards, something like that. And the scrape that was off the hill higher. Yeah, yeah, right. just yep. just a smidge. I was seeing, you know, scrape, you know, fresh scrapes, just probably I don't know, ten to probably around ten scrapes throughout this this uh probably quarter quarter mile trail, mm -hmm. and the whole time I'm thinking like in the back of my mind, you know, this almost seems too good to be true. Like this easy access route for, for a human to walk. I wouldn't think of, you know, a buck or an, especially a mature buck would be using this during the daylight and freshen them up. But as we hunted down that Creek, I, I like, and we walked through it, it was probably our third or fourth day walking down this. And so I was thinking by this time they're going to pick up our scent or, you know, maybe, be on the edge of the timber kind, kind of checking the road and looking at the road or, or whatever it may be. I just don't think that they would have been using that would in a certain situation, obviously I know you'd have to look at it in person, but is that something you would not shy away from in a sense, or would you try to hunt just on the outskirts of that? that you know, when you're hunting scrapes, it, everything is related to hunting pressure everything in deer hunting in my opinion so i would have to know what type of hunting pressure this area received was it an area where there was not a lot of hunters were or if there is hunters are they are they management type hunters are they only shooting three and a half year old and older bucks so you know deer can make movements as year and a half and two and a half year olds with no negative consequences so they're obviously going to do things in daylight hours that a deer in a pressure area wouldn't normally do so that yeah. would that would come into my mind. What type of hunting pressure does this area receive? And if I thought the hunting pressure was minimal, which if it was in Oklahoma, it would, it would definitely be considerably minimal to what I'm used to. Yeah. Um, I would probably set up something along that trail. And it would also depend on what type of, mm -hmm. you know, ground understory there was. If there was some semblance of ground understory or was the ground just totally bare. But if it had any kind of ground understory to give a deer some semblance of security cover, I, I would probably set something up for a morning hunt because the thermals are going to be going up in the morning where any deer that would, would, had been feeding down in those oaks, you know, he'd be able to smell it by taking that route on above it on the ridge side. Mm -hmm. uh, but then as far as in the evening, I would probably be hunting because I know you guys don't do scent lock so i'd be concerned about the wind i'd probably be hunting on the down you know on the lower side of those oaks where i could shoot to the oaks where does and, and then a buck may come in and feed 
you know, before dark um, and not win me because the thermals are, are going downward. But okay. uh, on the mornings, I probably would have set up on those scrapes, but it would all depend on the honey pressure in the area because if, if that was a wide open two track, you know, old, old lane with no understory around in Michigan, a buck wouldn't walk through that by down that in the daytime. Mm -hmm. Those are runway scrapes. That's not a scrape area. Runway scrapes are different than a primary scrape area, but those were obviously there because the buck didn't physically want to be down in the Oaks and he would, he was just set checking it. And, mm -hmm. you know, and those are, I, I consider scrapes along lanes and that's pretty common to have an old lane going through a timber or whatever and have a scrape here, maybe every 40 yards, every 30, 40 yards, there's a scrape wherever there's a low hanging branch. Uh, that's actually not that uncommon, but you got to, you know, is it made in the daytime? You know, that's, that's what I always think of, you know, all the sign in the world is, in, is meaningless. If it's not made in the daylight. Right. So, you know, a lot of scrapes, you'll go to a scrape area and it's just beat to crap on public land. But it's in an open area. It's in open timber, or it's it's in something where I know a three and a half year old or older buck's not going to be there in the daylight. Yeah, you may go there and kill a one or a two and a half year old subordinate buck, but if you're after three and a half year old and older bucks, you have to go into it from a different mindset. Is the security cover here adequate enough for a mature buck to come here during daylight hours? And it's got to. It can't just have security cover around it. You know, perimeter or around the actual scrapes mm -hmm. it has to have adequate transition security cover to a known bedding area because a deer is not going to move through open timber to go to a scrape area that has security cover around it he's not going to make that vulnerable movement during daylight in open timber to go there in the evening and he's not going to work that scrape in the morning after daybreak you're at the crack of daylight and then walk through open timber once he leaves it during daylight hours to go back to the bedding area so it has to have transition security cover to a known bedding area, and it has to have some semblance of security cover around the perimeter of the kill zone. That's so interesting. I've heard I heard a crazy stat. I don't remember where it came from, and it could, could totally be, be bro science. But I I thought I heard that the majority of scrapes are made in the the dark and oh, at but, night. Anyways, well, question, probably ninety five percent of scrape activity is made after dark. So so you're saying that that you have to, as a hunter, you can say, Oh, there's a scrape here, scrape here, scrape here. And you might find 10 scrapes, but you have to use that reasoning in your head of, okay, that's one puzzle piece. If I put the other ones together and they don't fit for a mature buck, he's just not going to use it. It's, you, that's, that's how you it. determine if it's at night. Yeah. Everything, no matter any location I hunt, it's all finding a great location is meaningless. If it's not used during the daylight hours by an animal you want to kill, you know, and, and, the older bucks get, the more security cover oriented they become. You know, if, if they weren't security cover oriented, they'd already be dead. They wouldn't be three and a half or four and a half years old. <laughs> That's the way you have to, you have to, you know, I, I say this all the time, you know, you have to pretend you are, everybody's trying to kill you. Yeah. Are you going to walk through here in the daylight hours? Of course not if it's open. You're only going to get up and move where you got some semblance of security cover and exit security cover. Now, yeah. when you're on TV or you're, you know, some <laughs> rich guy that has managed property where you see deer come out in wide open fields, monster bucks all the time, that's a totally different scenario. I consider that zoo hunting. Um, I don't consider those guys to have much of a skill set. I don't think they could kill deer in pressure areas because they have no concept of how to do that. So, you know, when you watch TV, that blows away anything I'm talking about, you know, because they walk out into thick cornfields all the time with without care. You see it all the time. I got to turn on is any, any TV show. <laughs> yeah. Almost any. I shouldn't say any. Almost any. Yeah. They come out into exposed food plots, pick cornfields, you know, at will. Guys sitting in a box blind that's totally exposed, and they still come over and shoot them. You, you, you're not going to kill a big buck out of a box blind in Michigan with a bow. <laughs> kind of a crop field. There's no way. Yeah. Unless it's a standing cornfield, that's a possibility, maybe. John, what do you think is the biggest mistake that people make hunting, you know, public lands? I mean, obviously, the, I mean, compared to private, it is a lot more competitive. There's going to be a lot more pressure and stuff like that. And for a lot of people, let's say if they want to go out of state or whatever, you know, most people have a nine to five. They're not, you know, so they're only basically weekend warriors. What do you see being the biggest mistake that they make 
on either these out of state hunts or maybe if they go to a new uh, WMA or something just outside of their their uh, town. Well, I think the biggest mistake most bow hunters, and I'm not going to say it's a mistake. I just don't think they put a lot of thought into it, even though it's the biggest advantage a hunter can have against white-tailed deer, is uh, scent control. Uh, most most hunters, probably 95 to 98% of deer hunters do not have a scent control regiment that works, where you don't have to pay attention when. When you can eliminate the wind direction, swirling winds, thermal drafts, that's a game changer. That's the biggest game changer there is in deer hunting. So scent control would be number one. Um, probably the next thing is it would depend on what you want to kill. If, if you're after mature bucks, um, you have to have the mindset of don't set up anything in an open area. You've got to have security cover. You know, when I go out and scout public lands in Michigan, 90% of the stands that I see are in open timber, you know, cause people like to see deer, you know, mm-hmm. and a lot of people, while I may want to kill a mature buck, you know, 90% of the hunters want to kill any buck or any doe that are hunting public land, you know? So, um, you know, it, it depends on what your goals are. If you're goal oriented, if you're trying to kill mature bucks, you got to pay attention to security cover, security cover, security cover. Everything has to be security cover oriented. If you're in a pressured area, uh, if you just want to kill deer, you want to be, you want to be at food, you know, some semblance of food, natural food, um, you know, deer have a way of knowing what's real natural food and what's not. You know, I know a lot of guys that used to hunt bait when baiting was legal in Michigan. And I know a lot of guys that still do hunt bait, even though baiting is illegal in Michigan. <laughs> and, you know, they tell, they, they're, they see does and fawns there on a regular basis. Uh, but buck wise, you know, after a hunt or two, even the year and a half and two and a half year old bucks that were coming in, quit coming in because, you know, they can, even if they didn't come in while the hunter was in the tree, they can smell that he'd been in there. If he didn't have a scent control, they can smell that he'd been in there and, you know, his intrusions. And, um, so, so your goals as a hunter would play into what mistake they make. I, in my opinion, I would never hunt open timber. That one last year is the first time I've done it since 1977. Um, Again, 90% plus of the stands I see on public land. I've actually got videos on my YouTube channel, you know, scouting public land. And there's ladder stands here, hang-ons over here. You know, they're all over in the open timber. And it was primarily this one particular piece was all oaks. So they were seeing deer. I'm sure they were seeing deer. (laughs) But they weren't going to kill any decent bucks. And it was kind of weird because there was swamps on both sides of this open timber. This open timber was probably 40 acres, but there was swamps on both sides with a river on one side. And as soon as I stepped off into that brush edge going down towards the river or the brush edge going into the other cattail swamp on the other side, there was rubs all up and down through that edge. You know, and there was small saplings out in the open timber. I saw one rub in the open timber. Everything was along the edges in the security cover. And I saw one stand, one stand that I thought this guy has a possibility of killing a decent buck in this stand. It's interesting you say that about the stands because I think I've had a similar experience where you walk through and you see a stand and rarely am I like, man, that's a great spot. You know, I'm usually like, what was this? What was that? This guy thinking? (laughs) It's usually like he brings in a ladder stand. I'm like, oh, that's where he got tired and decided I can't take this any further. (laughs) (laughs) That's a very valid point right there. (laughs) Yeah. It's like about 200, 250. I'm like, yeah, he got wore out. This was it for him right here. (laughs) And I don't blame him. If I was carrying one of those, I would, I'd be sitting right there too. So, and and a ladder stand is, I mean, that's totally off topic, but a ladder stand is another thing. I mean, when you're hunting in a pressured area, a mature buck walking through, through an area, he's going to pick out a ladder stand. He's going to take his eyes right up to the top of it. He's lived three or four and a half years old. He's dealt with ladder stand hunters before. And, you know, he, you can see a black frame steel ladder stand against a gray or an olive drab bark tree. And, and they just follow it right up to the top. And I've talked to quite a few hunters that have hunted in ladder stands with guns, gun hunters, which is pretty common. And, and they say it happens all the time. Those come, come through and they'll, 
you know, follow the ladder right up to the top and you know, sit in there and then scoop. So, uh, yeah, ladder stands uh, are not only heavy, you know, for, for shooting mature bucks in pressured areas, they're, they're not too cool as far as getting opportunities. It just no. sticks out too much like a sore thumb. It's like, it's like taking a pop-up line and putting it out in the middle of the woods someplace. You know, it's, it's just, it's just an obstacle. It's very obvious. If you're turkey hunting, it's fine. Cause when you're turkey hunting, as long as something doesn't move, they don't care. But when you're deer hunting, they notice things that are out of place in their, in their bedrooms or in their home area, poor areas. And, and if you're a mature buck, you just avoid it. You know, you see it on TV all the time, but in real life situations, you know, oh, those stands don't work that well <laughs> in pressure. Yeah. 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 It's interesting on the security cover side of it because, and you talk about most people wanting to be able to see deer and I, I I want to be able to see deer too, but it made me think of a, a recurve hunt. I did this last year. It was a draw hunt. It was two and a half days on a, on a big, uh, military base. And I walked into this spot and it was just a briar thicket of all briar thicket. It was disgustingly thick and it was, but there was a Creek line down the whole thing and it was filled with cedars and oaks. And I, I'm not sure they, I think they were red oaks, but they were, those oaks were like 50 cent pieces. I mean, yeah, the that, acorns were huge. Yeah. Yep. And you couldn't, I, I got in this tree that was a Y and I was saddle hunting in it and I had to put my tether on one side of it. And I had to put my, uh, my, uh, lineman's rope on the other. So I could kind of counterbalance in the tree because yeah. there was not a good tree in there. I couldn't shoot 15 yards. And I showed the guys that I was riding with. Cause you have to ride with people to the stand. They don't, it's a military base. So they don't allow like everyone to have a car. So, rode with them and i was showing them i was like yeah i'm in here and this they were like is it thick in there and i was like oh you can't shoot 10 yards and i was like but i'm recurve hunting so i don't really care and i was wanting to test my theory they set up along these big open creeks just big nice pastures so they could see our long ways and at like nine o'clock in the morning had four does walk right underneath me in that creek and it was like 11 30 and i was fixing to get down to the tree and move where i saw those does come from and I heard crashing in the creek and I looked down, there's a 125 inch buck standing at the base of my tree and I couldn't shoot. I shot him through a hole in the cedar about eight by eight. And I shot him and they were like, how did you, how'd you see that buck? I was like, and I, it made me think of that conversation we had with you last January. I was like, I was in the thickest stuff and I had good access and I had a right, the right wind. And that buck, he just came right by. It was awesome. That, that is awesome. I love that story. That's thinking outside the box. You got down in the security cover, and and, and it happened. And you get you don't see a lot of deer when you're in security no. cover typically. But I don't care if I don't see deer. You know, to me, I, I only want to see one deer. The fewer deer I see, the higher my odds of getting a physical shot. You know, the more deer I see, the more likely, the more possibility there is of getting spooked. And you know, if something spooking. You know, maybe picking you in the tree or something. It's pretty rare with a saddle, but uh, there's always that possibility when you only have one deer or two deer and they go by, you're going to get a shot. And, uh, you know, that that was pretty cool. Now, why I have to ask why? Because mature bucks move a lot in midday. Mm -hmm. And usually it's 11 to 3. That's my midday time frame. So keep that in mind, but I was just curious, why were you going to get down when you just had a doe and, you know, four does go by? Well, I had, so that's a good point. A, a piece that I missed in the story, there was a buck with those does and he stayed about 45 yards and he paralleled this little ditch that went across. It was about a hundred yard strip of timber and that Creek ran uh vertical to it. So it like split it in half and he had went down this ditch 40 yards up there and he had something, did something completely different from the does. I was like, well, I'm not going to watch a buck do that exact same thing. So I was like, I'll wait till about 1130. And I waited and, and a buck came right across the Creek, right underneath me. I was like, I'm not waiting till 1130 shot that buck. And in this place, you get another tag. If you shoot a buck over 115 inches mm -hmm. because it's recurve. So the success rate's like 3%, 2%. So they're like, too. yeah, it was, yeah, nice. it was my, my recurve first recurve cool. buck hit him in the neck. I'm not going to say I'm a great shot with it, but. I got him. He went like 150 yards, but I got another tag and I sat there the next day just because all my stuff was set up. It rained the whole day, did not see a deer. And I went back and I got in the truck and the guys that I was hunting with, they're like they said they hadn't seen anything. I said, did you see anything? I said, no, I shot a buck there yesterday. So, and I sat there all day. I didn't see anything. I'm going to move. It's only a two and a half day hunt. So I went to another area, like three quarters of a mile to the South 
set up and saw the weather change. I saw 15 deer that morning and had another buck come in on the ground as I was getting down. Cause you have to be out of there at a certain time. Like it's very strict on the military base. So I was getting down, had another buck come down this Creek at 30 yards. Didn't shoot him way too far with my recurve. But the other guys were like, man, you're, you're seeing so many deer. And this was another situation. I had to bust through these, uh, this, uh, briars just to get into this spot. But when I got it opened up and it was another red Oak flat, just oaks and creeks everywhere. I mean, it looked amazing. Wow. And I was just seeing deer after deer after deer. And, you know, there was a lot of other folks that were seeing deer too, but those guys I were hunting with, they stuck, they brought those heavy ladder stands, uh, hang ons with ladders and they hunted the same spot for two and a half days and they never moved because wow. they didn't, they weren't mobile. So saddle and then get in that security cover. It, it seemed to be the ticket right there. Security cover is always going to kill you more deer than being outside of security cover. That was an interesting hunt. I'm just curious. The one you shot in the net. Mm -hmm. We need to put a caveat there. <laughs> uh, net shot is not a shot a normal nope. person wants to take. You obviously hit the juggler vein, and that's why it didn't go that far. So mm -hmm. most people shouldn't take shots at the net. <laughs> yep, don't do that. I shot a. I was shooting him. I was about shoot. He was a little body deer. He was like 118 pounds field dressed. That's like awesome. A, Big rack and a small body. It's easy to drink. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was like a, a, th a 30s type eight point. And then I would have yeah. got up to him. I was like, oh, this is a doe with a rack. I mean, it was, but I shot him about four or five inches too far forward is what it ended up being. So I hit him real low, like heart, you know, but right in front of the shoulder, right at the base. Oh. And it, so got lucky there, but it was, no, it was an awesome hunt. And just like we're saying, traveling and going different places, it was a place I had never seen a spot that thick with briars and that thick with cedars because on a military base with all the ammunition, that place has never seen a fire ever, right? There's right. never been, so that cover was as thick as it's been. And I remember sitting around the camp at night that they have a fire and everyone just saying, it's thicker than anything I've ever seen in here. Like it's so thick. And I'm like, that's why there's so many deer in here. Like they, yeah. there's deer everywhere. It was awesome. What you said on that second second hunt was also kind of cool that you busted through all this red brush. Now, had you e-scouted that a little bit and you saw oaks on the other side of this this heavy kind of You're right. cover? Yeah, okay. and there's on Onyx, there's that layer that shows you the historical right. oaks. And yeah. so I was looking in there and I was like, I bet that's thick. But it, I talk about a pattern where I'd hunted before. It mirrored that same look with topography and how thick it looked in the oaks. And I was like, I bet it looks similar. So I got in there and. It wasn't like 30 minutes in here come deer, just all sides. See, what I love about that story is you, a lot of guys won't bust through briars. They won't go through that heavy crap because they're not mobile. They can't. They can't go through that stuff with a tree's tank, you know, even with a hang on because it's such a big cumbersome frame on their back. Uh, it's definitely not with a ladder stand, but because you're so mobile, you can bust through that stuff, even though it's still difficult you're having to spin in circles to get the briars off you while you're moving forward um but a lot of times when you do that and you go through this dense stuff it breaks out into an open utopia for deer <laughs> you know what mm -hmm. you want to say a lot of times you know when i'm crossing rivers to get rid of other hunters on public land with waders or whatever you know there's going to be brush along both sides of the river but once you cross the river and go through that buffer a brush along the edge of the river it opens up into a deer utopia where there's you know oaks and you know some sort of nut trees for deer to feed on and they can feed on those before they cross the river and exit after dark it's yeah that was that's cool i love that that's a great story yeah you know, it was you kill something on the second hunt you got one on the first hunt and the second one you saw a lot of deer and the potential of killing a big buck with there it just didn't happen on that set yeah yeah that's right no it was it was fun. And I, trust me, I, uh, I hate walking too through all that thick stuff, but, and usually oh, when I have yeah. my compound and my, <laughs> yeah. my compounds, like, I don't know, it's, it's not super heavy, but I noticed even switching to that recurve, it's like two pounds. It's like, Oh my gosh, I am the mobile hunter of all mobile hunters with this thing. Cause it's just a stick. Like you're just, you're carrying a stick and then your saddle and your stick. You're like, I can go anywhere. Yeah. I can walk as far as I need to. It's awesome. Are you the guys? that I did those modified saddles for? No, uh -uh. no, okay. I did a podcast. But you can send me a modified saddle. <laughs> if you know. I did a, I did a uh, podcast with two guys and I, they, yeah, they sent me saddles and I had them modified. So I was just curious. Well, you, you mind me asking what you're using? Yeah, I was using How long a, you been doing it? 
Yeah, I was using a cruiser saddle. Um, a lot of good things about the cruiser, comfort wise. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. We were using the cruiser and then we run, I was running out on a limb platform and sticks. They're pretty light. So yeah, that's just what I've, I've ran for the last few Shakir, years. Those are Shakir sticks, I think. Oh, yeah. The Shakars. Yep. Shikars, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, like, yeah. 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 They were neat. So it was fun. I love saddle hunting. I had to convince, I had to twist Jake's arm, but he's in the game now. He's been in the game for well, a couple years. It wasn't that I didn't like the idea. I just didn't like the dollar amount that came behind that <laughs> idea, but it's like a buy once cry once thing. And, uh, I will say I was skeptical at first, but it's night and day, like 20 times better than carrying a climber or a hang on or anything like that. It's once, enjoyable. And once you get a saddle you're comfortable with, la- I'm still hunting out of the same saddle I bought in 1981. Mm-hmm. I've made modifications to it, but it's the same saddle I've hunted out of for 43 years. And yeah, so it's a one time deal. You know, you never have to buy another tree stand the rest of your life. So that's a <laughs> huge, huge monetary savings, even though you got to spend maybe. Six or seven hundred dollars to get into saddle hunting correctly, but that's a one. Right. What was modified about about those fellows' uh, saddles, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, well, they had bought my signature saddle, the ESS, and my my signature saddle has stuff on it that I don't like on it because it had to be on there for liability purposes. I I am not a leg strap guy. I those get cut off immediately. <laughs> um, so the leg straps got cut off, uh, the little hooks on the D rings got cut off that the leg straps attached to. Also, I am not a fan of the belt, the waist belt on an ESS, uh, it comes off, it comes off the inside of the saddle it, on your hips. So you've got a lot of your saddle hanging down in front of you while you're walking, if you're wearing it or while you're climbing the tree. So I cut the waist belt off. I actually have an Amish guy that owns a harness and saddle shop. He does this stuff, but he cuts Mm -hmm. the waist belt off. And then I put a quick attach strap through the D rings and it goes over to this side of the saddle. And there's a quick adjust, quick adjust buckle, just like you'd have on a backpack, backpack straps. We put it on, you just grab that tag, tag into that strap and pull it down and it snugs it up. Mm -hmm. If you step into the saddle, pull it up above your waist, grab the tag end of that strap that's going through the d-rings and then pull on it and everything tightens up d-rings everything's tight around you for climbing or walking or whatever um and then i also made a fixed bridge most saddles come with an adjustable bridge which the ess does as well and once you figure out your bridge length you never change it you know you you leave it the same all the time so i tell people hey get, get the bridge length you like adjust it how you like it and then you know, when you send it to me to get it modified, I'll just have him cut off all the adjustment stuff and just make it a fixed bridge of the same length that you like. Mm-hmm. So you're getting rid of an adjustment buckle. You're getting rid of a tag end of the bridge strap from the adjustment buckle. You're getting rid of this heavy waist belt with the huge buckles, the disattached buckles and putting on plastic, you know, just a quick adjust strap on it. And you're getting rid of the, the leg leg straps so it it rolls up into the it's literally the size of a softball when you're done when you roll it up that's yeah. awesome yeah i mean and you can wear it in or you can put it in your backpack it doesn't take up squat for space i mean you still have to have your tree tether and your lineman roll so do you only run the only like a method of attachment to you is the belt system itself you don't run any leg straps no what's what's the purpose of a leg strap I don't know. I'm not a. Well, you, you tell me, what do you think it is? I I would assume just another point of connection for for safety, but I've never fell out of a tree in a saddle, so I don't really know how it exactly works. The leg straps were put on there in case you slid through the seat. The leg straps would stop you. Well, if you took the leg straps off and you slid through the seat, where would you stop? Shoulders. Your armpits. Yeah. They come up your armpits, which is what. 14 inches, maybe 18 inch max. I got like a 60 inch torso. So (laughs) (laughs) whatever that may be. So, you know, you're, you're going to stop at your armpits anyway. I mean, and the odds of sliding through a seat got to be like one in a gazillion. (laughs) I mean, it's just not going to happen. So, and the leg straps are designed when you're hunting, they're not supposed to be tight anyway. They're supposed to be just dangling loose. So they serve no function in my opinion. It's probably for those guys that uh, like to fall asleep 
in a tree. I mean, I, I fall asleep I think, in a tree all the time. <laughs> Every time when I'm in a tree an hour and a half before daylight, I always lean against the tree and fall asleep until day, but daybreak. Yeah. It's hard to do in a saddle. It's a, it's a lot, a lot better sleep in a climber for sure. Well, I can sleep pretty good in my saddle, but I, 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 I keep my tree tether where it's pretty much a 45 degree angle of the tree. So when I'm standing on my ring of steps, you know, I'm hooking up my tree tether, you know, it's, it's at chin level. So it's coming down here. It's not going up here like that. Mm -hmm. So I can lean forward and put my head on the lead strap and put my arms around the lead and, you know, just fall asleep really, really easy. If you have to sit in an upright position, yeah, you can't fall asleep. But if you can lean forward and put your head against it because it's at a 45 degree angle, it's really easy to fall asleep. If I'm For tired me. enough, I'll fall asleep anywhere. <laughs> and, and also because it because my my saddle is a two panel saddle, I can I can take, you know, the one panel is underneath my butt, you know, right at the bottom of my butt cheeks, and I'll take the other panel when I'm gonna sleep and I'll actually put it up into my lower back. I'll raise it up into my lower back, which off, which pushes my upper body forward to lean on the lead. Plus, it gives me back support. So that's that's a huge advantage of a two panel. It's just a lot more comfortable, and you can adjust the seat depth as you need for however you want to sit at the time. That's interesting because the the one panels like they sell that as like an add on attachment, like that lower back strap or the yeah. mid back strap. To yeah. yeah, that's true. You could just use that top panel to do that. That's that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And probably, and it's, it's more comfortable too, because anytime you get a saddle, single panel saddles all have a strap at the base, at the very bottom of the seat, there's a strap. Usually it's an inch and a half strap. And then there's some sort of fabric or mesh that is the seat is made from. And then you have a strap at the top. So basically you have an inch and a half strap at the top, inch and a half strap at the bottom. Well, if you're sitting on an all day set, that strap at the bottom because that is a that is a weight supporting strap that gets to be a stress point you start to feel that on a long-term sit because it's only an inch and a half wide and it's supporting a lot of your body weight if you're in a sitting somewhat sitting position whereas when you are using a two panel saddle at least mine you've got each panel has two two inch straps just the seat belt material so it's exactly the same width as a seat belt so it's got two of those on each panel so if you when you're hunting if you take those two panels and butt them up to each other which gives you about an 11 inch seat you have eight inches of strap all weight supporting straps supporting your butt and it conforms to the shape of your ass <laughs> so so it's just a lot more comfortable on a long-term set yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I did my first all day sit this year on that second sit of that recurve hunt and I did it in the saddle. And like I told you before, I had that Y tree. So I had, you know, two, two, yeah. uh, on each one, one on each, uh, thing of the tree. And I fell asleep one time with my arms in between the Y of the tree. And I woke up, I swear, cause it was raining all day that day. I woke up an hour later and I went to you put my feet on. Of, you just made a lot of points with me hunting all day in the rain. I love it. Yeah. And, and my, my feet were as numb as they've ever been. I put them on there and I, I remember just going cross my feet crossed. They were numb. I couldn't stand up for like 20 minutes. I just sat there and just moved my feet. Getting the blood back into your Oh, they were so <laughs> numb. If I would have tried to descend into the tree, I would have fell right out. It was terrible. So you didn't have any gout? I don't, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. That's, that's funny though. That's funny. Well, by the way, I, uh, we were talking about, uh, that midday, you know, shooting that bucket 11, whatever, after yeah. Oh, yep. Um, just to give you some stats, I don't know if I did this on the last show with you guys, but um, of my of my 35 Michigan book bucks, 20 of them were shot between November 1st and November 14th. Our gun season opens November 15th. So 20 were shot in that 14-day period. Of those 20, Seven of them were shot between 11 o'clock and three o'clock in the afternoon, while less than 8% of my time spent on stand during those 14 days throughout the history of my kills was spent during 11 to three. So 35% of my kills were done midday during 8% of my time spent on stand during midday. 
So that's how that's how important midday hunting is during the rut phases. If you're in an area where there's security cover, where they're pursuing those or pushing those or breeding those. So what you're saying is sleep in in the morning and then just hunt from 11 to dark is what you're. If, if you have <laughs> that type of spot, typically a lot of times when you're hunting in, a, in bedding areas, you can't go in for an afternoon hunt because you're spooking deer with your noise of your entry. So mm. typically, you know, I hunt a lot of bedding area interiors of bedding areas because of the security cover issue. Uh, during the rut phases. So I'm in there way, way before daylight. So I'm in there before the bucks transition into the bedding areas and I sit all day. So I'm not spooking anything with my exit. So, mm. so I sit on my all day sits is the only times I've shot is when I've shot those seven bucks, you know, between 11 and three, but most of my hunts, the majority of my hunts during the rut phases are either mornings or evenings. So if that made, did that make sense? Yeah, no, no, it did. It did. Okay. Uh, I wanted to touch on, on the bumping deer side of it because there's, and I've been guilty of this too in the past where, you know, you have a, you have a pin on your map on, on X, uh, marked, and you really want to go check that out. But on the way to that spot, you end up bumping, you know, a buck and a doe or something like that, I guess, depending on the time of year. But in the past, I thought as soon as I bumped that deer, okay, Hey, he's seen me. Um, it's probably game over for, for him. I'm just going to, uh, <coughs> sorry. I'm just going to go, go to my spot, check that out and just to see what it looks like. And then on your way, your way back, you end up bumping. I assume I thought it, it was that same buck and doe. And so now I really think, Hey, he's really not going to be there tomorrow morning. So I'm just going to go uh, a little bit further than I was, uh, yesterday. And then walking through I swear to God, it seemed like it was the same buck and doe on this little, this same little ravine. And uh, I just want to get your opinion on, I guess, have you had any experience on maybe bumping a buck and uh, setting up on that? I mean, I know there's a strategy named after, you know, the bump and dub, but I, I just kind of want, want to get your, your take on that whole situation. Well, there's a big difference though, because what you just what you just said, that buck was obviously with a hot doe. Right. So, you know, and she probably wants to come back to her core area or he wants to come back to his core area because he feels comfortable breeding her in that type of security cover. He feels comfortable in that area. Uh, so bumping a buck during the rut with a doe, the likelihood of them coming back because there's two deer and that's probably their core area is is higher than just going out let's say during mid-october the october lull or early season and bumping a buck and then mm -hmm. you know yeah the odds of him coming back that day or the next day are slim to none if you're in a pressured area um so it's, it's totally different if you're bumping them with the hot dough or just bumping them where they're bedding you know outside of the rug phase Mm -hmm. I am not a bump. I am not a bump and dump guy <laughs> whatsoever. You got to hunt in a lightly pressured uh, area for uh, bumping and bumping and dumping to work very well. Yeah. Well, bucks, mature bucks. If you're after three and a half and four and a half year old bucks, and you you bump them, um, you know when they're not with odd. Oh, yeah. The odds of them coming back and bedding in the same spot are pretty close to zero. So you would say, <laughs> yeah. So you would say mainly just if you're going to bump and dump, do it during the rut when they are chasing. Yeah. Okay. Well, because that situation I just uh, told you that was two years ago. And then last year, uh, granted the weather wasn't, wasn't very good at the time and uh, it was super hot. And, but every year we go down to this public piece for, and, and we stay a week, we call it our little rutcation down on, on some public and the first five days, I was jumped, jumping around like crazy, couldn't see a buck. And then finally, uh, we had a front move in. It was kind of getting rainy and all that. And I was like, I haven't seen a deer yet. Instead of just, you know, sitting inside this tent, I'm going to go walk around. So I didn't obviously carry a bow, camera, or anything like that. Uh, I just made this one big loop right, right outside our camp just because uh, by the time I got, you know, to this spot it's probably going to be dark so i'm just going to go check around i just wanted to see a see a deer basically i walk down this this little finger and it kind of makes a u uh going up this little hillside and on my way back up from the second 
uh, little finger that I was walking back up and then going to walk back to camp. Uh, I bump a giant buck and it was on a doe and they were bedded, but it was super foggy and all that. So I didn't think that it was that big of a deal. They just, I was 15 yards from them. So obviously they had to get up regardless of what I was and uh, ended up setting 60 yards from where they were bedding. And also I kind of like put my head in to where they were laying and there was some like, I don't know what kind of bush it was, but it was just shredded. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm sitting right here along this finger. The next morning I set up there and not 10 minutes after daylight, uh, I assume it was the same buck and doe because it was a very significant buck. And I'm sure it was the same one too. Yeah. You're probably yeah. Right. yeah. And, uh, long story short, I was a newbie to a set or not a newbie, but I was out of the, I was out of the loop on like shooting a deer out of a saddle okay. and, uh, it was on my weak side shot and again, big rack deer. So I just completely go black and so you pull the ball over top. Oh of yeah. I tried to, I tried to torque myself instead of just like stepping through the saddle and doing it right. I tried to just torque myself. And again, it was a far shot, probably 45 yards. And when I say that arrow wasn't, even in the same county, I didn't mess it by a little bit. It was by a lot. And so I seen that buck and doe uh, run off. And then, of course, I was kicking myself. I said probably every every word in the book. And I decided to sit there that next morning. So I was like, you know what? The doe picked me off right away. The buck only ran away just because the doe ran away. And so I sat there. And next morning, again, it was probably – five, 10 minutes after shooting light, uh, there's a 110, 115 inch buck. And of course I'm going to get my redemption on that just because it's the fifth day of the trip. And, uh, an odd asterisk by now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, uh, ended up getting that one. But then the following day, because here in Oklahoma, we get two, two tags. I was like, you know, we're only going to be here for another day or two. I'm just going to set this same spot just in case for some reason that buck decides to, you know, chase another doe back through. I know he's in the area mm-hmm. and I ended up seeing a, a a different buck walked down that same finger. And so what I realized is like, it felt like I wasn't being aggressive enough, I guess on finding spots. Cause it seemed like if you find at least during the rut, you know, if you bump a deer generally, you know, that's probably a place where other deer like to be as well. Well, you were in an area where there was doe activity, those bed in that area. And that's why those bucks were sifting through there. And obviously the, the big one, he came back the next day. She was still in heat. When you shot the smaller 110 incher, she was out of heat, so she was not coming back through there with that other buck. If she'd have still been in heat, which they did, they're not in heat that long, she would have probably mm-hmm. came back with that same big buck again. So yeah, when you're doing that bump and dump during the rut, it's a, it definitely works way better than it does outside of the rut because usually if you bump a buck, he's going to be in an area during the rut where there's doe activity because that's what that's all they're thinking about is sex. You know, during mm-hmm. the rut phases, all buck activity during the rut phases revolves around does and sex. So they're going to be where does are going to be. And that overrides a lot of times their security precautions. You know, where normally they wouldn't have came back to that spot once they were bumped there, you know, outside of the rut phases. They will during the rut because their there's sex is overriding their brain and they want to breathe. That is a good point because both of those scenarios were definitely during the rut. Uh, but yeah, I kind of made up my mind. I was like, that's, that's kind of what I want to do. I just want to walk around until, until I find a deer. Now, granted in, in this property, it's, it's, it's pretty vast. And so I don't, I feel like if I do bump something, as long as it ain't like, like a scent bump where it's like, okay, that's a human I'm getting out of here. Right. I think I can get away with it. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times when you bump deer, especially if you bump, a buck with a doe usually it's the doe you're bumping and then he's just leaving with her mm-hmm. he may not have been bumped because of the intrusion he just left because she left that's happened to me several times and i ended up killing the deer so mm-hmm. you know because i came back later the next day and shot that same deer that i bumped with that doe she was still in heat so mm. that, is, that has happened to me before. It wasn't intentional. It just, you know, it happened that way. Yeah. It wasn't something I tried to do. I never, never try to bump and dump deer because typically for that to work, you've got to be in an area that's very lightly pressured and where there's a lot of mature bucks. 
Yeah, that's a that's a good point. I'm I'm curious on the you said 35 percent of your bucks came from a that 14 day window in the midday. Um, right. I'm curious. Do you think in a heavily pressured area, the reason that you're killing so many of those bucks in the midday is because of that typical hunter pattern of in in at daylight, out at 10 a.m. What do you think it is, or do you think it's yeah. a different reason? I think like humans, they're lazy. <laughs> they're lazy. And it's much, much simpler for a buck to bed down before daybreak, get up 10, 11 o'clock in the middle of the day, and then go and set, check his core areas looking for hot does. You know, all the go activity has moved through and it's bedded down. And now he's not out running around in open areas looking for does or anything. He's just resting in the morning and then getting up midday and sent checking whatever security cover he has in his core living area for for hot does and then he'll usually by three o'clock they're done uh and then they bed back down and don't get up until after dark or they may get up if they're in a dense bedding area they bed down in a dense dense bedding area for the rest of the day they may get up and move 10 20 30 yards in the bedding area before dark but they're not going to leave the security of the bedding area until after dark so it, it is interesting because you see when I see mature bucks, especially on public, it mature bucks, no matter where I've seen them, just seem to be not in a hurry. They seem to be strolling, doing their like yeah. doing their thing. So you you think these guys just like to they like to sleep in and they just do what they what they want to do when they want to do it. They have just a plan. Out. They have a plan. Even when I've been in Iowa and or Kansas, uh, I've, I've, I see bucks during the middle of the day. I don't have to hunt during the middle of the day. I don't do all day sits when I'm out of state. But when I've been driving around or scouting in the middle of the day, I see big bucks up and moving. But I don't, but because there's so many mature bucks out in those states, I don't have to hunt in the middle of the day to kill one. You know, because the big bucks will also move mornings and evenings, but they also move during midday. They move, they move as much mornings and evenings as they do prior, you know, prior to season. I think they they have that morning and evening movement during daylight hours. Um, whereas bucks in, in a heavily pressured area just don't, they just don't move much during mornings and evenings during day, you know, daylight. They move more during midday during rut phases where they're searching and breeding, breeding hot does. That's one reason I love hunting bedding areas. Um, you know, when a mature bug gets a hot doe, he's going to typically push her into a bedding area. He's going to force her into a bedding area, just like what you're talking about you know, where he was going back to that secure area. And that's where he does, bedding areas are where they do their breeding. So they're going to push a, push a doe, a hot doe into a bedding area. They're going to breed her. They're going to bed down, shield the doe bed down. Buck may bed down 15 to 20 yards downwind of her uh, if they're in heavy cover, you know, heavy weeds or something. So he can still smell her. He's within smelling distance of her. And if she gets up and moves, he'll get up and move with her or maybe 20 minutes to a half hour goes by and he wants to breed her again. They breed multiple, multiple times when they're in estrus. He'll get up and push her around when he goes over to, you know, to bump her up to breed her. She's, she's going to run 30, 40, 50, 80 yards in the bedding area. She's going to do the little chase thing and he's going to chase her and then she's going to stop and he's going to breed her again. So when you're hunting in a bedding area, that kind of activity when they're in the secure bedding area, that activity can happen anytime during the day when they're physically with a hot doe. Um, but, you know, midday, as far as when they're in the search mode, that midday pattern is awesome because if they're not with a hot doe, they're going to bed down and they're going to get up sometime between 11 and 3 o'clock and search that bedding area that they may be in. And then if there's adequate transition security cover, to another bedding area within their core area, they'll take that security cover to the next bedding area and search that one. You know, just all they gotta do is walk around inside of the perimeter. They can smell water, anything that came into that bedding area, you know, after daylight or before daylight ago. And then they'll they'll basically search everything within their core area that has those bedding in it as long as there's transition security cover from one area to another. So they won't check this bedding area and then walk through 150 yards of open timber with no understory to set check another one. You know, they'll wait till after dark to do that. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. It's, I, I, I'm curious, you talked about, you know, the difference between hunting Michigan and Kansas and how, 
you know, you don't have to hunt Kansas in the midday because you can get it done on a mature buck in the morning or the evening, you know? And so what are the differences in tactics? You know, uh, obviously these places are different terrains and topography and looks altogether, but what is your difference in tactics from a heavily pressured hunting area, say public land to a, you, when you to juxtapose that to a state that you go to that also you're hunting public, but it's not nearly as pressured. What are the differences in your strategy? At the Hunter's Advantage, we live by the KISS slogan. You were not supposed to tell them that. No, I meant we like to keep it simple, stupid. All jokes aside, Exodus is the definition of keeping it simple. Let's say you aren't really sure what arrow setup you should run. The Exodus Arrow Builder will help you build the right arrows for your exact setup. Or if you don't have time to change those trail cam batteries in the dog days of summer, Exodus has a great selection of cell cameras and regular trail cameras. And if you pair them with one of their solar panels, you'll be set for a long while. I've shot over a dozen deer and a big old black bear in Saskatchewan with these arrows, and I trust them to fly right and get the job done. And they have something for everyone with the Exodus NIS micro diameter arrows or the Exodus MMTs. So if you want to save money on Exodus arrows, cell cameras, or anything else they got on their website, make sure to check out ExodusOutdoorGear.com and use code HA10 for 10% off. Once again, that's exodusoutdoorgear.com and make sure to use code HA10 for 10% off at checkout. Now let's get back to the podcast. Hey guys, I did want to mention that my friends over at Exodus just launched an awesome new SD camera, the Exodus 4K Lift Ultra. This is anything but a standard SD camera. It offers 4K video at 30 frames per second with audio. It has dual lens with dedicated nighttime and daytime image sensors. And one of the things that I think makes this camera really unique is it offers rechargeable 18650 batteries. The camera also has a two inch LCD screen so you, so you never have to worry if it's pointed in the right direction or your camera sitting looking at the right spot. The Lift series has been the cornerstone of Exodus since they launched it over nine years ago and this 4K Ultra is no different. Make sure to use code HA4K to save $50 off the new Lift 4K Ultra at checkout. Once again, if you want to support the podcast and our friends over at Exodus, make sure to use code HA4K for $50 off the new Lift 4K Ultra at checkout at ExodusOutdoorGear.com. Now let's get back to the podcast. Peace. Well, when I when I go out of state to like in Iowa, Kansas, Missouri, there's just a lot more mature bucks. You know, the mature buck to mature doe ratios are much higher. In Michigan, I would guess... And this is just a guess. But on average, in my opinion, there's probably one three and a half year old or older buck to every 40 other deer. You know, mm. and I'm talking two and a half year old bucks, one and a half year old bucks, fawns and does. So I'd say at least 40 to one. So they don't have to compete that much for breeding rights. As soon as they finish a breeding a doe and estrus, it doesn't take them long to find another doe in estrus because typically, you know, Michigan's got tons of deer. We got lots of deer. Just going, coming to Michigan and killing a deer is not a problem. We got lots of deer. So it doesn't take them long to find the next hot doe. And if she's with a year and a half or a two and a half year old buck, he just takes her away. It's not even a fight because they've already done all the pecking order stuff uh, earlier in the year. You know, when they shed their antlers through the October lull, they've done all the pecking order through sparring. So they know the pecking order. He just steals her from the doe or from the other buck. So in Michigan, I try, for the most part, let my hunting locations work on the merits I chose them for. I'm not real aggressive. When I go out of state where there's lots of mature bucks, they they compete heavily for breeding rights. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of rattling. I use decoys. I use scents. I use tarsal drags. I do a lot of things differently. And I don't have, and because there's so many mature bucks, I, we also do cameras. You know, I, when I go out of state now, I go with my kid and we put a camera at every single one of our hunting locations and they're cell cameras. So we've got an inventory of what's going on all the time. Used to, we used to actually put regular SD cameras at our locations. And every day during midday, we would physically drive as close as we could. A lot of times we would drive a four wheel drive pickup truck within three feet of the camera, get out and check the SD card. And it didn't affect deer movements. In Michigan, you would never do that. <laughs> you know, you would never do that. Uh, back in Michigan, I didn't use SD cameras because it was an intrusion into a hunting location. I might have used one 
to get an inventory someplace where deer are moving after dark just to know what's in the area. But I'd never put it at a hunting location. So when I'm out of state, we put up cell cameras at every single hunting location. And we primarily, we hunt according to what we have on our cell cameras. If we get a picture of a buck coming in on an evening to a scrape area, you know, we'll hunt it the next evening and, and the odds are real high. We're going to kill that buck that next evening. Or if we get it in the morning, we'll go in there and hunt it the next morning. And odds are high that buck will come in again to the same spot unless he has actually taken up with a hot doe. But decoys, rattling, everything works out there. Everything. And, you know, why hunt all day when you don't have to? All day, hunting all day is grueling. I remember the first time, the first and only time I went to hunt in Missouri was on 40 acres of private land. A guy, I cold called a guy out of, out of the flat book. This is back before Onyx. And uh, he let me hunt 40 acres and it was all bedding area. And I hunted like you did. I hunted all day in the rain, four days in a row. It rained <laughs> all day. And, I, and it wasn't a hard rain. It was just a light drizzle rain. You know what I'm talking about? Great for deer movement, buck movements. And, um, and the cool thing about rain is the bucks have to move a lot, and especially a drizzle rain. They have to move a lot to scent check stuff. You know, because there's no winds carrying the scent and the odors through the through the air because it's rain because it's raining. And um, so I hunted all day, four days in a row, hour and a half, four daylight till dark. I was getting about four hours of sleep a night. And on the last morning, when the alarm went off at 3 a.m., I was so tired. I was just sleep deprived. And I hit the snooze three times. And finally, I said, and I was by myself. Uh, I said, John, you're not going to kill anything laying here today. You know, you came out here to hunt. And I got out of bed and I shot 160 inch, 23 and a half inch inside spread 10 point that morning. Good God. And he was with a doe and he was breeding her in a cornfield. I was hunting along the edge of a standing cornfield. This was gun season too. I shot it with a bow, but I was bow hunting during gun season. And I got in the tree and I could hear, even though it had, the corn was wet, it's still, I could hear a, a deer out there chasing in the, in the standing corn. You could hear the corn rustling. And as it was getting daylight, it kept getting closer because it would do exactly what I said they do in the bedding areas when they're breeding. He would chase for maybe 20 seconds and then you wouldn't hear anything for 10 or 15, 20 minutes. And this is before daylight. And that happened like three times. And then as it's starting to crack daylight, it's getting closer. So that doe is coming closer to the edge of the corn or to where I'm at. And now it gets broad daylight. And all of a sudden I hear this rustling again and this doe busts out of the corn. Now I'm sitting facing the corn's right in front of me. I'm 180 degrees. I'm on the six o'clock position in my saddle. You know, so I got the tree hiding me. And this doe came out on my right side. Now, something that you don't do, obviously, is you don't use a ring of steps in conjunction with your platform because you didn't move around on your ring to take right. it out on your strong side. You tried to do it on your weak side. So this doe came out. So I immediately thought the buck was going to come out behind her because it was pretty open timber behind me. I was actually going to do some rattling in this tree to try and bring a buck out of this standing corn you know, after daylight. But anyway, this doe comes out. So I moved around on my ring of steps to the opposite side of the tree, 180 degrees. So now that's at nine o'clock, basically. It's going to, it's at my nine o'clock from over here. It's at my three o'clock from my initial position. And then I hear the corn rustling over to the side. And I'm like, that buck is going to come out over here because she's just standing here. He's going to come out over here and he's going to swing around her and push her back into the corn because he wants to be he wants to be in that heavy security cover while he's breeding. He doesn't want to be out in this open area. So I swung back around to my original position before I even saw him come out, but I could hear him come in that direction. And sure as crap, he came out right here at like 15 yards from my tree and I man and it stopped him and it shot him. But he was circling, he was going to circle around her and push her back into the security of that standing corn to breed her. Uh, I don't even know how that, oh, the honey in the rain. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But see, and also it was worth getting up, getting up that morning and, uh, and hunting in the rain. Well, you, I, I love the rain. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you, you travel hunt in a van too, right? I 
do. Everything's in a minivan. I buy a Toyota minivan about every five years. And I first thing I do is take the seats out and put them in my garage. And so I've got a wide open back end and I put all my totes in there and my boots and my sled and my cart and everything's in there. I got a little rubber mat to change on and uh, I just slip between the seats and change and open the side door and go out. Has there been any hunting adventures where you sleep in the van? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Quite a few. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can take a couple of the totes because the totes are all stackable. So I can stack them over to the side and put a sleeping bag because it's all carpeted in the back. And I've got a little, little air bed mattress if I want to do that. It just rolls up. You know, it's pretty small. Heck yeah. I my mean, son, I... my son did that. Uh, Chris, God rest his soul. He passed away from cancer a few years ago, but uh, he actually wrote a book on it called Whitetail Access. It was published by Deer Deer Hunting Magazine, Krause Publications. And he, he had a, a Chevrolet minivan. I use a Toyota. Um, and his was a, an all wheel drive. And he went out west. He lived in Germany, but he came home for six weeks. He was going to go on a six week hunt, hunt five different states and on all public land, all out of his minivan. And he shot five bucks in five states in six weeks. And he spent 2,300 bucks. Oh, that's my awesome. Gosh. And four of them were Pope and Young Buds. Yeah. <laughs> and he wrote a book about it. The deer and deer hunting guy, when he was going to write an article about it, the editor for deer and deer hunting, Dan Schmidt, said, you need to write a book about that. Nobody's ever done that before. On twenty three hundred dollar budget, kill six bucks in five states in six weeks, never be done again. He's going to add a, a couple, couple extra hundred to that for that taxidermy bill, though. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He did get them mounted. One of them was one hundred seventy one inches. In North oh my god! <laughs> yeah, that's so awesome. You couldn't stay in a hotel for a week for twenty three hundred bucks now, so. That's, no, he, he, yeah, he was eating Campbell's soup cold out of the can every night. You know, he, he, yeah, he was he was pretty hardcore kid. That's, that's awesome. awesome. He actually worked for Meat Eater when uh, Steve first started Meat Eater. He was uh, working with Steve a little bit. Oh, that's cool. On the what and what part of the business? Like video or uh, video hunting? I think they went to Africa together. Oh, that's so cool. Because Steve's from Michigan as well. Right. Yeah. Right. Oh, no. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a cool memory. Can't ever lose that one. Yeah. Yeah. That that's cool. cool. I'm I'm interested. I've heard you I've heard you talk about this topic a little bit. Um, you know, we you know, we're talking about money in 2024 and how much everything costs. It seems like a, as a broader hunting culture, we're kind of moving into this place of access is dwindling on private. You see the leasing yeah. culture, kind of how that at that's moving along. And we've seen it in Kansas and Southeast Kansas quite a bit of a lot of people that are getting kicked off these private and leases moving on to the public. So it's increased pressure on the public. What's your, you've been hunting for bow hunting for over 50 years. What's your general thoughts on like, you know, the future of, of public and how the access and the experience that we're going to have as bow hunters? Well, I think, uh, and I've already seen it. There's a lot of guys that are dropping out. I shouldn't say a lot, but there's a small percentage of people that, uh, that used to gun hunt on public land that quit. And I quit hunting. Mm -hmm. I quit gun hunting because I almost got shot on public land. In Gosh. I had a bullet hit six inches over my head in 1991. Yeah. That was the last day I ever gun hunted. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, the hunting public has also brought a lot of people, you know, the YouTube guys mm -hmm. into the public land hunting. And I see hunting, I don't see it, it's an actual fact. It's going in the direction of European style hunting, where it's going to be, you know, something for wealthy people, you know, leases, you got to own your own property. The public lands will always be there. And they're just a lot to me, they're much more of a challenge. And they're getting a lot more pressure because of properties being leased up and because of the hunting public drawing so much attention to hunting public land and now all of the saddle companies are doing it too because it's such a mobile concept of hunting you know it's perfect for public land where you can just walk in with your saddle gear you know your mobile gear walk in find a place to set up and hunt on the spot you know that diy hunting is becoming very popular and it's a serious challenge kind of like what we were doing down in um, indiana so 
I see as far as private lands and getting free permission, that's going out the window. That's very, very difficult anymore. Uh, public lands are always going to be there, but there's going to be more and more pressure. It's going to be more and more difficult. Um, Onyx aerial photos has also added another level of, of pressure because, you know, the places that I used to hunt where I'd cross rivers or hunt islands in cattail marshes or in swamps where you had to find those on foot, you had to physically find them on foot with work. Now you can see them on, on aerial photos. Mm-hmm. So everybody has access to that same information and you can mark them on your Onyx waypoint, mark them, and then go check them out before you had to find them. Um, so it, it's, it's becoming public land hunting is becoming more difficult. It's more, more pressure than there ever used to be, no matter where you're at in the country. But to kind of combat that, a lot of hunters on public lands and you guys are two of them and I'm another one. You know, a lot of hunters nowadays are passing up on year and a half old bucks. And a lot of hunters are also, some of those hunters are also passing up on two and a half year old bucks. So they're targeting three and a half year old bucks and older. So there's a lot more mature bucks on public lands now than there was prior to, I'd say, 2000. Back in the 70s and 80s and 60s, uh, if you killed a two and a half year old inch, 14 inch wide eight point, that was a monster. Because in Michigan, we had a million gun hunters and they shot anything that was legal. If it had three inch spikes and gun season, it was dead. So very, very few deer made it to two and a half years old. Killing a two and a half year old buck was a big deal. Killing a two and a half year old buck anymore, even on public lands, even though it's a challenge, it's, it's not a big deal like it used to be. So there's a lot more bucks that are surviving to a little bit older ages on public lands, but they're getting a lot more hunting pressure and everybody has access to the, to aerial photos. So it's hard to find hidden gems on public land. Yeah, that that's a good point. I mean, I do think I see a, I see a shift. Like people seem to be more management minded in terms of like, Hey, I want to shoot a little bit bigger buck. I'm not okay with shooting a basket rack, even on public with my bow. So that's encouraging. But it seems like from a pure access standpoint, and I know COVID, like you can't really compare that because that was like a nobody was working. So everyone was in the woods. So I'm not yeah. saying that. It seems like it's balanced a little more since then. But, you know, the the reality is the more that the leasing becomes unaffordable and like free to access permission kind of goes away because people realize you can make a buck on it. It just seems like the overflow bucket is that public land. And even right. if, 50% of those people are management minded. It just seems like it's a, it's a hole that's going to be very hard to fill. It is. Yeah. I was doing a, a seminars at the Wisconsin deer expo, probably around 2008, 2010, somewhere in there. And I had a guy come into my booth cause I was also selling my books. Uh, I, they gave me a booth as well. And I was talking to him and he was my age at the time. He was in his uh, early sixties and I asked him, you know, where he's from. And he's, because the way he was talking, he was very knowledgeable deer hunter. He knew, he knew what he was talking about. And he said, I, I live in Iowa. And I said, whereabouts in Iowa? And he said, well, you being an out of stater, it would be in zone five, because you know where zone five is at. It's in the central southern Iowa. And I said, oh, okay. Yeah, that's a phenomenal. What the hell are you doing here in at the Wisconsin Deer Expo if you live in freaking zone five in Iowa as a resident? Mm-hmm. And he said, I used to hunt any place I wanted when I was a kid up through my forties and even into my fifties, I had tons of private lands because I knew all the farmers in the area and I could hunt. I had unlimited areas that I could hunt for free. And he said, now everything is leased. Everything has been either bought by rich guys that, you know, that want to own the property. And back then, if, if you own property, and you actually could go to Iowa, even though you didn't live in Iowa, you could go to Iowa and somehow get an Iowa driver's license. You could get two buck tags every year. But to the guys that were leasing the property that were non-residents, they would only get drawn for zone five. Like back then was like every three or four years. Now it's like every five years. But he said, anyway, everything is leased or it's privately owned. And I, they don't let me hunt there anymore because when they lease the property, you know, the leases don't want somebody else with for free permission hunting it. So he said, Wisconsin has a lot of public land where Iowa does not. So I'm, I'm coming up to Iowa to bow on now. And I, I just thought that was a shame. I just, 
I just, I struggle with that, but that's the reality and it's not going to change. It's just going to continue to get worse. Everybody wants to kill big bucks and just like people wanting to shoot crossbows because they're easier. Killing big bucks is easy if you own a lot of prop over property and you don't let anybody else hunt on it and you manage it. That's, yeah. the, that's the easiest way to kill big buck other than going to an enclosure because you don't have any competition. Well, in, in Texas here, it's, it's really bad. Like there's 35 million people in Texas Mm -hmm. and I'm not a native Texan, but I've observed it being down here. Like where I live, you know, just North of Austin, there's three major metroplexes. There's Dallas, there's uh, Austin, there's Houston in this triangle right here in the central and Eastern part of the state. And there is like, when I say no, I mean literally like no public land, like very, very little at all. I went to a a piece that's a little over a thousand acres in mid December, which Texas has a two month rifle season. So that doesn't help. And in mid December, there were 16 trucks on this place wow. <laughs> and each truck had multiple, multiple people in it. And I was just like, yeah. this is unsustainable. Like this just doesn't work. I, in my mind, I start thinking about the wheels start turning and it's like, is there some sort of program they could start where it's like a, an will <laughs> donation of like a, like a big bucket of access. Like we, you know, once we get a certain amount of money in this bucket, if it's self-imposed, if hunters want to donate to it, we'll get another piece of access or get another piece of access. Cause for me as a, you know, I, I would throw in a couple hundred bucks a year if that's what, that's what we needed to do to acquire more public land. But it just doesn't seem like that's, that sort of stuff's happening. Yeah. Well, yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, Michigan, they're still, they're still buying lands and turning them into public still i mean they just did one last year and that place where i scouted i said i saw all those tree stands in that open timber Mm -hmm. that had just been bought two years prior and turned into public land um yeah i I feel sorry for some of you guys in some of the states because some states just do not have a lot of public land kansas doesn't have a lot of public land indiana has tons so does ohio so does illinois uh michigan has tons of public lands uh, it seems like in the Midwest, there's just a lot more public lands, but it's public lands are typically lands that are not tillable. Okay. Mm-hmm. So when mm-hmm. you get down into Southern Ohio, Southern Indiana, Southern Illinois, that's where there was a lot of mining back in the early 1900s through probably the 1950s, whether it be for iron ore whatever whatever the ore may be there was just a lot of mining and uh, it was all in those hill countries and at the at the foothills of those hill countries which was tons of acreage and once the mining went dead uh you know that land is pretty much worthless for anything else so the state bought it or the federal government bought it and it just grew up there's a lot of places now you can go in Southern Ohio, Southern Indiana, like where we were at, and it's all mature timber. You, can, you can't you can even tell there was ever any mining there. You might see a sheer cliff once in a while, rock cliff, where you can actually see the lines down at where they blew dynamite to break the cliff away. Huh. You know, so you could see the, the remnants of mining, or you might see pipes here and there, or old concrete structures where there was a building that had something to do with the mining uh, but other than that all that all that land across there through the Appalachian Mountains um, you know that was kind of taken over by the government and turned into public hunting land and but if you've got land that's still usable it's tillable you know people can plant ag in it the price of that land is going to be too high for the government to afford to afford to buy it so a lot of the lands now in Michigan that are turning into public lands, some of them were actually donated, you know, by rich people, you know, when they die, you know, we want this to turn into public land because uh, once in a blue moon, you'll see one that's a farm, you know, maybe a 200 mm-hmm. acre farm with hundred acres of timber and open ag areas. And now that's public land. And it was something that the property owner donated to the state. I bet you their grandkids were pissed. Uh, probably, <laughs> uh, and, and sometimes they didn't have they didn't have other relatives. Yeah. I, I, uh, I've got two pieces of private property with free permission, and one of them is uh, an older gentleman. Well, he's my age; he's seventy two, and uh, he he has bro- a brother and a sister, but he'd never been married, and he doesn't have any kids. So hmm. you know, somebody like that's 
could easily donate something to the state because his brother and sister don't need the money. That's interesting. I'm, I can tell you the, uh, the cattle ranchers love the Weeha program in Kansas because I've seen so many bear freaking pasture with 200 head of cattle on it that has no deer, <laughs> deer on it at all. They probably love that program. <laughs> I love it in Kansas. Uh, the last buck I shot in Kansas was on walk on free walk on. on. There's a lot of, there's not a lot of public land in Kansas. In my opinion, there's way more W O H walk on hunting land in Kansas, at least where I'm at. And that's kind of cool. Cause on Onyx, you can actually pull up that on an app and it'll show you all the walk on hunting properties. Yeah. The Weehaw is awesome. And on those walk on hunting properties, I think the state at one time, Back when I first started hunting there, I think the state was paying them like a dollar an acre to, you know, open it up to free hunting every year. Oh, maybe they're not making a killing then. That's, <laughs> yeah, no. interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, and to go back to the, your, uh, you know, the, the buck with the doe coming back the next day and stuff. Uh, also, a lot of times, you know, during the rut phases, it's, it's relatively common especially in an area where there's not a lot of deer for bucks to really enlarge their core area during the rut phases, you know, mm -hmm. they may double or even triple it. And, and it's very common to have a buck taken two to three miles away from his core area during the rut, because, you know, maybe that buck, maybe he had bred a couple of does in his core area where he actually lived. And I'm being hypothetical here. And right. then once the, that second doe was bred, now he's looking for the next one. Maybe he picked up a doe that her core area crossed over and overlapped into his core area. So he picked up that doe and then she led him over into her main core area. And then once he was done breeding her during her cycle, maybe when he started looking for the next estrus doe, there was another doe that came into heat. And her area overlapped into that other doe's core area. And he picked her up and now he's moving into another core area. And now after you do that two or three times, you could be several miles from your own core area. So, you know, he likely could have been following that doe around. And that was where she typically bedded. And that's why those other bucks were cruising through that area. That, you know, the one you killed and the one you the next time. Right. Yeah. No, that's a good one, point. That might not have been his real core area. He was just <laughs> with her. And she felt mm -hmm. comfortable going back to that. Because does are more comfortable going back and betting to the same location the next day as a mature buck would be. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't know. My whole reason for doing that, it wasn't just to like test any theories or whatever. Again, I was just tired of not not seeing a deer. And uh on day five or or six, whatever it was, it was just it kind of got my wheels turning because now I'm going to the next season. Like, Oh, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Going to do. Cause we usually take the, we usually take that rotation, you know, around the same time each month. And it, granted now we're going to do a little bit better planning on uh, maybe trying to wait until a good front starts to move in. But uh, I was just thinking, you know, if it was, if it's around the same time period, I feel like I need to maybe be a little bit more aggressive to find those deer instead of like trying to, pick out, you know, something that I think looks good and not want to intrude on because I don't want to bump those deer. Does that make sense? Yeah, it definitely makes sense. During the rut phases, you have to be a little bit more aggressive than you are any other time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've been doing pretty good during the lull the last few years. Uh, I mean, two, two years, three years ago, I shot three book bucks. Two years ago, I shot two. Last year, I shot one. Um, but the ones that I shot other than the 11 point last year, the ones I shot in Michigan, I rattled them all in out of standing corn during the long, mm -hmm. which is something I do a lot. <laughs> I do a lot now because I, I, I look at those as free hunts because if you've got, if you've got a standing corn field, let's say you're hunting public land that butts up to a crop field and okay, this year it's in standing corn. Uh, you can go hunt along the edge of standing corn and try to rattle something out of it because usually mature bucks will bed in the standing corn. So it's it's pretty common, you know, for them to be in standing corn. So it's because it's such dense security cover, they will step out to the edge of standing corn to respond to a rattle sequence or a sparring sequence. I usually do sparring sequences. 
So I consider those as free hunts because when you're hunting the edge of standing corn or you're hunting the interior of, of a cornfield, um, it's you're not interfering with your rut phase locations that you're going to hunt once the corn has been picked. Mm. Once that corn has been picked, anything along the edge of that standing corn is worthless because the buck's not going to come out into that open vulnerable area during daylight. But when you're hunting that standing corn while it's still standing before the rut phases, typically they're free hunts because you're not interfering with anything of your rut locations that you're going to hunt once the corn has been picked it or farther into the timber or into the swamps. So that's why I consider those as free hunts. Or a lot of times I'll be scouting public lands, okay, and in the postseason, and I'll scout a public land. And it's usually in the swamp. You know, when I'm hunting public land, it's it's almost it's probably eighty percent of the time I'm in some semblance of heavy security cover in a swamp across a river or something. And I'll scout something, and I'm like, okay, I, this is okay, but it's I've got better spots than this because I've got a lot of public lands that I own. So I've got better spots than this, but this is a spot I may consider because it's a, there is a bedding area here. I may consider coming in and hunting this as a free hunt during the lull okay so i may go in there because i'm not going to hunt that during the rut that's not in my rut phase location places to hunt so i'll go in there during the lull which is when deer are sparring for pecking order you know as soon as deer shed their antlers they're sparring they're sparring with each other and you may see a 10 point sparring with a four point but they're just pushing each other it's not an all-out battle you're sparring for pecking order so i'll go into those bedding areas that i'm not going to hunt during the rut phases and I'll do sparring sequences. And uh, two years ago, I shot a really nice eight point doing that in the morning. You have to go in <laughs> before daylight because you don't want to spook anything with your entry. So you got to, you know, just like during the right, you got to be in there an hour and a half set up before daylight in your tree and then start rattling maybe a half hour after daybreak. So, you know, I, there's a lot of things you can take advantage of during the lull that's not going to interfere with your rut phase locations and the and rattling or sparring a long-standing corn or in a bedding area that you're not going to hunt on public land during the rut phases, um, you know, I consider those as just free hunts. What do you consider the lull period? And what, where, when in October is the lull in your mind? Me, after the fourth or fifth day of op the opener in Michigan, uh, most bucks are nocturnal outside of bedding areas. So, and I consider a cornfield to be a bedding area and obviously a swamp to be a bedding area. So I consider the law in Michigan to be probably October 4th or 5th through about the 20th, 25th of October. Okay. That's when mature bucks, you know, they're not, they don't have, well, as soon as they shed their antlers, they have breeding on their mind, but their testosterone has not gotten to the point where they start thinking with other body parts in their brain. They're still got their mindset of security cover in mind during the law. So they're still bedding in the bedding areas and only moving in the bedding areas during daylight or in the standing cornfields. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Well, um, John, we really appreciate you doing this. It's always oh, fun to pleasure. talk to you. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I learn something every time, and I, I really appreciate you going into individual stories about bucks and hunts because that just that just helps us learn. Even though we're two thousand miles away, there's still something you can take away and apply it to where you hunt. So we always, we always enjoy talking to you. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate I appreciate you giving me the chance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. I've got a pretty good platform, and you get a lot of viewers. So, you were uh, talking about your book uh, before we jumped on here. When's the uh, when's the release date on that? That's a good question. <laughs> oh. My other three books, I all they were all done through a publishing company, so I just sent them the manuscript and the pictures, and they designed the book and took, copyrighted it, and they did all the work. I just got a, a royalty. So this book, we're, I'm doing it in conjunction with Greg Godfrey from Tethered, and uh, we're self-publishing. So um, I, I think realistically, realistically, we're going to be looking at this fall, probably. I would it's love to say time. earlier than that. I started doing this in January of 2023 uh, is when we signed our contract, and I've been writing. I mean, I, this thing has got so much information in it. There will be no other book, anything remotely close to this. <laughs> it's got it was, 70, it's going to have over 70 short kill stories that will lend credibility to the chapter that they're in, the section of the chapter they're in. And I've got stories from Mark Kenyon, 
I've got stories from Andy May. I don't know if you guys know who Andy May yep. is. Mm -hmm. uh, Garrett Prawl, who owns DIY Sportsman, um, the YouTube channel. And then I've probably got over 50 kill stories myself. And when I say kill stories, they're they're very abbreviated. They're anywhere from three to five paragraphs. Uh, Ernie Powers got a couple kill stories in it. Uh, and Greg's probably going to have seven or eight. I've got everybody's stuff except Greg's. Greg's the only one I'm still waiting on some some uh, material, but uh, it's going to be very interesting. Be sure you add a lot of pictures for uh, people like me that have a have a fifth grade reading level. So <laughs> I have about 150 pictures there. Okay. All right, good deal. And That's I awesome. Hope, I hope the paper version. Uh, we're probably going to do it in a glossy glossy paper with colored pictures. So. That'll be awesome. So wait, be on for, the for, that. for people that want to um, interact with you, you know, before the fall. So where's the best place for them to either watch your YouTube channel or uh, get a hold of you? I know you're huge on answering people on email and stuff. So what's what's that information? Every day. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll have some entertainment since we've been talking. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, my my email is on my website. My website is D E E R hyphen J O H N dot net. Um, my YouTube channel is Eberhart Outdoors, and I think I've got 120 videos on there. Um, the books I currently have published are on my website, or you can get them on Amazon. Um, but I'm really excited. I would I would recommend if anybody's going to buy a book to wait till this next one, because this next one's going to it's going to crush the other ones. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, that yeah, that that's about all I can think of really. <laughs>